We are in the book of 2 Samuel. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to open up with us. 16th chapter. Entitled the message, Faithfulness and Discipline. And you know, you just look at God's faithfulness, even when we're going through some of the most um, difficult times. And sometimes it's even things we've brought upon ourselves, right? And, and I, I think this is an incredible chapter. Remember what's happened at this point, David, uh, King David has sinned greatly against the Lord. He had committed adultery, murder, as he had sent Uriah uh, into the heat of the battle and, and uh, intentionally had the men pulled back while, while he's killed and, and David all of this in order to, uh, to cover his sin, to, to hide what he had done. And now uh, he's had a, 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 a child who was taken from him. I mean, think about all of the things that's happened to King David as a result of, you know, the things that, that he brought upon himself. And, and then we, we know that uh, his daughter raped by his son, you know, incest. I mean, it would just, it would just, it seemed like all of these things and Nathan had warned him that these things would happen as a result of what David had done. And, you know, you look at all of them and you go, man, you know, what, why, why would all of this be just so openly declared? Here's, here's the king of Israel, the, the man after God's own heart. And, and the Bible just, just kind of just exposes. You know, I, I think God, I, the Bible's written. I wouldn't want my life to be put in those pages. <laughs> Because he doesn't, he doesn't cold punches, you know? It's just everything just kind of, this is what happened. And I think it was written so that you and I would, would, would understand what sin does. The consequence that sin brings. And so that you and I are able to navigate through life with, with, you know, with the warnings that God gives us. And we look at David's life and... He's now reaping those consequences. And one of those consequences was that his son, Absalom, would rise up against him. And that has transpired. David's fleeing Jerusalem is where we pick it up in chapter 16. And he's fleeing Jerusalem. He's already at the Mount of Olives. And we come into chapter 16, verse 1, where David now is probably at one of the lowest points of his life. Bummed out. You know, I, I can't imagine, you know, there's one thing when you really have nothing and you're going through trials, but now David was in charge of a kingdom. He had, you know, accumulated wealth. He had accumulated, you know, power, and, and then now all of it's stripped away. And it seems like at that point, you know, it, it kind of has a, a greater cost, a greater a greater, uh, you know, value to what's going on. Now, look at chapter 16. When David was a little past the top of the mountain, there was Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, who met him with a couple of saddled donkeys and on them 200 loaves of bread and 100 clusters of raisins and 100 summer fruits and a skin of wine. And the king said to Ziba, what do you mean, to do with these. And Ziba said, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride on, the bread and the summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine for those who are faint in the wilderness to drink. Now, you know, the thing about David sees a familiar face. If you remember back earlier, we talked about Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, who was really one of the servants of Saul. And Saul, Mephibosheth was Saul's uh, grandson or Jonathan's son. And so, you know, here's a, someone who's coming to bless David, someone who's coming to encourage David. And in the middle of, you know, that moment in life when, when someone comes along and just gives you a breath of fresh air, a little bit of hope, you know, and, and he's there kind of, you know, David probably very excited to see uh, uh, Ziba, and then also, you know, that he's coming to bring help, to bring resources uh, on the travel. But what's interesting, and no, no, notice what happens in this next verse. Watch this. 
And the king said, and where is your master's son? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he's staying in Jerusalem. For he said, today the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father to me. And the king said to Ziba, here all that belong to Mephibosheth is yours. And Ziba said, I humbly bow before you that I may find favor in your sight, my lord, O king. Now, we'll find out down the road that Ziba's lying. And he's, he's coming at one of David's weakest moments, you know, to come and, and try, try to manipulate it for his own good. And, and I, I thought, well, what, what, what an interesting time that this man would choose. We're going to find out that Mephibosheth, is, is, he can't walk. He's, he's lame. He was dropped when, when uh, Saul and Jonathan were killed. And there was, there was a, you know, an accident as they were running. And he, he ended up being um, affected as a result of it. He, he couldn't walk. And, and what we find out later is that Ziba went and got everything ready and left Mephibosheth behind so that he can go and try and fi- find favor with David, right? But, but that, what, what struck me in this whole thing was Satan's always going to come when we're in our lowest point to br- try to bring deception. You know, it, it, it's how he operates. He's going to look when you're down at your lowest. He's going to look when, you, when, when you're, you know, the most vulnerable, and then he's going to bring his lies to try to, you know, further his purpose or his kingdom. And, and th- th- those, those kingdoms are, are contrary. They're, they're in opposition. Anything that, you know, Satan attempts to do is, is to try to thwart the plans of God, trying to undermine the things of God. And what's, what's incredible in this whole picture is that David at this point is, you know, just heartbroken. Matter of fact, turn real quick to Psalm 69. Just, just to kind of give you a picture of what David is kind of experiencing. And, and, and it's there in verse 1. Watch what he says. Save me, O God, from the waters that have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My my eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without a cause and more than the hairs on my head. They are mighty who would destroy me. Being my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. Oh God, you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. Let not those who wait for you, O Lord, God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel. I mean, well, what, what a chapter. I mean, think, think, and you read the rest of the chapter where David's at, he's feeling the shame of all that he had done. On top of, you know, now being kicked out of the kingdom or him fleeing the kingdom, and, you know, he, he's, in, he's in this vulnerable place in his life. And, and it's right then that, that the, the enemy strikes. You know, it's right then that, you know, here comes this guy looking to somehow uh, undermine, lie, cheat, connive in order to get David's favor. And, and David buys it. And I think that's the interesting part here is that, you know, he's thinking, you know, that Mephibosheth, I can't believe this guy. I sat him at my table. He ate dinner with me every night. You know, I shown him kindness. I did everything. And then now he's over there trying to take the throne too. I mean, you know, everyone hates me. You know, no one likes me. And, you know, it was just feeding into David's depression, David's overwhelmness. And, and that's how Satan, you know, just likes to manipulate things to try to, you know, kick you when you're down and and you know here here it's not just your son that wants to take the throne it's it's now Mephibosheth who you'd shown all of this this kindness to he wants to take the throne too and and David's like you know what everything that was Mephibosheth is yours now and he just makes a rash statement here and he's going to find out later that he made a, a a wrong decision now verse five you know you think that's that's bad enough you know you got Ziba coming to lie to you but now watch watch this look at verse five and when king david came to behurim there was a man from the family the house of saul 
whose name was Shimei, the son of Gura, coming from there, he came out cursing continually as he came. He threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And Shimei said, thus with his, when he cursed, come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue. The Lord has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned and the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom your son so now you are caught in your own evil because you are a bloodthirsty man. Now, it was, it's bad enough, you know, you got, you got people trying to manipulate but now you got a guy who's just blatantly cursing you. You, you know, you're... God's the ones against you. You know, this is all your fault, David. You're just a, a rogue. You're, 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 you know, you, you didn't deserve to be in the throne of the first. Like God's getting even. I mean, you know, David, at this point, can you imagine? Just like, you know, I can't win. Everyone hates me. This was someone from Saul's house who really blamed David for the overthrowing of Saul when Saul was the one who, you know, David wouldn't touch him. David could have killed him on a few occasions, but he chose not to. David had the opportunity to spear him to the ground, and David, I can't touch God's anointing. Mean, David was, was innocent in this, in this accusation. And, and he, he, here's, here's the interesting part. Look at the next, the next verse. And Abishai, the son of Zerah, said to the king, why should the dead dog curse my lord, the king? Please let me go over and take off his head. I like Abishai. <laughs> I like, like, yeah. You know, and, and when, when, when you kind of feel wronged and you feel like someone's, you know, mistreating you, the, the, the first instinct is, you know what, get even. I mean, you know, the, the, this guy's nobody. He's throwing rocks at the king, kicking up dirt. I remember early on when I was pastoring and I was still working a full-time job, there was a guy who, who really stiffed me. You know, I was a general contractor and he, you know, ripped me off bad. And, and you know, every, I wanted, you know, I was just, oh, I just, and there was a guy coming to church and he was, he was, he was, a, he was crazy, just to put it that way. He was kind of Abishai guy. And, and I, you know, I was telling him, I was just so frustrated, and I was sharing with him, you know, man, I can't, you know, I got, and he goes, you want me to take care of him? Because <laughs> I know things, man. I can, you know, no one will even know. We will, you know. And, you know, and for a second, I'm going, what a great idea, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you realize, you know, that's not the Lord. I mean, stop it, you know. <laughs> but you realize that, you know, there, there's, Here's David and his men are going, David, let us go just remove this guy's head from, from him. And, and I love David's response, man. I mean, what, what a heart. Watch this. And the king said, what have I to do with you, you son of Zerah? So let him curse because the Lord has said to him, curse David. Who then shall say, why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and all of his servants, see how my son who came from my own body seeks my life? How much more now may this Benjamite let him alone and let him curse for so the Lord has ordered him. It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will repay me with good for the cursing this day. And David and his men went along the road to Shimei, went along the hillside opposite him, cursed him as he went, and threw stones at him and kicked up dust. And the king and all the people who were with him became weary, so they refreshed themselves. I mean, what, what, what a response. You know what? Leave him alone, man. All of this stuff I brought in myself. And who am I to go and, you know, do it? Maybe God's the one who's, you know, humiliating me in front of all of these people so that, you know, God can have his way in all of this situation. And, and I, I just love that, that David understood the sovereignty of God, even in all of this. You, you know, God's on the throne. God's going to do what he's going to do. I, I, I just need to trust him. Whatever that looks like, God's the one who, you know, is, is uh, allowing this to go down. And David had a great understanding of, 
uh, this was the consequence for his actions. David knew that. And all of his dependence was on, you know what, it may be that God will rescue me through all of this. It may be that, that God is allowing this to be, for me to be humiliated, but you know what, in the end, because of my response to this, God will bless me tremendously. Guys, that, that's a deep spirituality. That, that, that's someone who understands the character and the nature of God. Remember, remember David's title. I think if anyone wanted to be called something, it would be a man after God's own heart. Isn't that a great kind of title to have for your life? That's a man after God's own heart. It didn't mean David was perfect. We, we, we know that. We've been, we've been studying through his life. It meant that, that David, when he came to his senses, every time he blew it, he'd run back to the Lord. It meant that when, when, when David was in his right mind, he, he, he was understanding that God is the one who raises up and God's the one who takes down. David knew this with all of his heart. It wasn't because he was so mighty and great. It was because God had anointed him and had called him. And, you know, his, his confidence wasn't in his power. His confidence was in the Lord. And if your confidence is in the Lord, then you, you know that even in the dark days, even in the trouble sometimes, that God's the one who's going to see you through. That, that's, that's where, that's where uh, depth comes. Anybody can walk with the Lord when everything is going good. It takes depth to walk with the Lord when things aren't going so good. It takes faith. It takes confidence. It takes, I, I'm going to trust God's character in spite of what I see and what I feel. And David, David was that man where he was able to come back and say, look, I, I'm not like you, Abishai. I, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna stoop down to the same level as this guy. I'm, I'm gonna put my confidence in the Lord. I'm gonna put my confidence that God is gonna bring me through this and it may be that he's gonna, he's gonna restore me and, and fix me and heal me and he's, he's, gonna, he's gonna bring me back into the position that he had for me. You know, he understood God's heart and that God was the judge. And what, what, a, what a great place to be, to put your, hand, your, your life in the hands of the Lord. And that's, that's where David was. Now, verse 15 is, is an interesting passage. Meanwhile, Absalom and all of the people of the men of Israel came to Jerusalem and Ahithophel was with them. Now, remember, Ahithophel was David's close counselor. He was a good friend. He was the one that, that David would confide in and they worship together. You know, David was, was someone that uh, had a, 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 an incredible relationship with Ahithophel. Now, Ahithophel was the grandfather of Bathsheba. And it seems that Ahithophel never forgave David for what he had done. So this bitterness had continued to stay in his heart. And he sided with Absalom when, the, the, when Absalom re, uh, rose up against his own father. And he became his counselor. And David understood that, you know, Ahithophel was a very wise man. That he was someone who uh, was a good strategist and a good counselor. And so David sent Hushai, was, which was another one of his counselors, back into Jerusalem. Hushai came and said, you know what, I'm going to go with you, David. He said, no, do me a favor. I don't want you to go with me. I want you to go back into Jerusalem. And, and I want you to counter what Ahithophel tells Absalom because you're going to do me more good there than you would to be with me. And, and what's interesting is Ahithophel, you know, wanted nothing more than revenge upon David for what he had done. You know, destroyed his, his you know, his granddaughter's life, you know, adultery and and, and then her husband killed. I mean, you know, he had held on to all of this stuff. And this, this is what's interesting. Look, look, look at verse um, 16. It says, and so it was when Hushai, the archite, David's friend, came to Absalom, that Hushai said to Absalom, long live the king and long, long, live, long live the king. 
So Absalom said to Hushai, is this your loyalty to your friend? Why did you not go with your friend? And Hushai said to Absalom, no, but whom the Lord and this people and all of the men of Israel choose, I will be. And with him I will remain. And furthermore, whom I whom should I serve? Should I not serve in the presence of his son? As I have served in your father's presence, so I will be in your presence. And Absalom said to Ahithophel, give advice as to what we should do. And Ahithophel said to Absalom, go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house, and all of Israel will hear that you are abhorred by your father And the hands of all who are with him will be strong. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the top of the house. And Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all of Israel. Wow. Guys, this is significant. Think about the advice of Ahithophel. What Ahithophel is doing is he's wanting to further humiliate David. Getting all of his wives and having his son go and have relations with them. It was, it was a further, uh, you know, humiliating of David, but I also think it, it, was, it was kind of that bitterness that he was holding on to. You know what, you, you went and had violated my granddaughter, you know, we're going to go in and violate all of your wives. And, you know, bitterness has a way of, of, of you know, causing destruction, and, and Ahithophel's reasoning was this, once you do that, then everyone's going to know that you're aboard in the eyes of your dad and that there's no fixing that relationship again. Therefore, they'll make a choice between you or your dad. And what you th- think about what's happening, guys. It's division. And, and Satan knows, man, as long as we can cause division, man, we, we, we will conquer. It's divide and conquer. That's Satan's goal. He always is looking to divide and conquer. And he's looking for two loyalties, if he can divide your heart to two loyalties, he wins. If he, if, if he, if, if he can divide a church into you know, two camps, he wins. Right? That, that's, how, that's how Satan operates. And, and now here I hit the foul's advice. You know, go and divide the nation and make everyone choose because there's never going to be a, 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 res, res, you know, a, a fixing or a resolution or a restoration of these relationships. Again, once you do that, I mean, it, there's no fixing it. And he knew it. And it's interesting that he would use sex as, as, as the tool because of David's sin. But, but it, it was also not only David being humiliated by the guy cursing him, now he's humiliated in front of all of Israel. Everyone knows that, that David's concubines, they, they were kind of the, the second tier wives. <laughs> they, were, they were all gonna be uh, you know, humiliated by his own son of all things. Now, what, what, what's also interesting in, the, in this whole picture is Back in chapter 12, go, go, go back just to verse 11 and 12 with me. Look, look, look at chapter 12. Remember when David was being rebuked by Nathan? Watch this. Chapter 11, verse, is that where I was? Chapter 12, that's what, that's what I said, right? Okay, there we are. Verse 11. Thus says the Lord, chapter 12, verse 11. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. Guys, what was happening in, 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 in chapter 16 was... Nathan's prophecy coming to pass. And, and what, what strikes me when you read that, like, wait, God had told David this was going to be the consequence for his sin. And, 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 and now you're watching his own son, you're riding in front of all of Israel, you know, as, as he'd go into the tent with one concubine after the next concubine and humiliating David in front of everybody. And, and, and all of it was God ordained. God had foretold. 
this was going to happen. And I guess when, when I read that, it, it struck me. You know what, what, what God says always comes to pass. When God declares something, it's going to happen. Now, that's why all the warnings of Scripture, guys, we, you know, we, we should take, because, you know, God says, whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. You sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. You sow to the spirit, you reap everlasting life. That, that, that is a universal spiritual law. It doesn't change. You know, you're not going to be the exception. Well, you know, that might be true for everybody else, but not for me. No, it's true for you too. You sow to the flesh, you're going to reap the consequences of that sowing. You sow to the spirit, you'll reap the, con- you know, the, the benefits from sowing to the spirit. It, it's, 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 it's like the law of gravity. It's going to happen. You're not going to defy the law of gravity. You might think you can defy the law of gravity, but you're not. You can go up on top of the, you know, because I think these paraffits are about 24 feet. You jump off, you're, you're going to break something. The law of gravity is going to win. It's no different with the laws of God. It always wins. It always comes to pass. What it says happens. And, and you know, it's, it amazed me because Nathan prophesied it. And here we are just a few chapters later. And, and just like God declared, it comes to pass. And, and, you know, it was all because of the counsel of Abishai. And God uses, you know, men... And even in their, in, their, in their wickedness and their evil to, to, you know, bring about what he declared. Interesting. And, and then watch this. Verse 23. And the advice of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was as of one had inquired of the oracles of God, so was all the advice of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. Now, what, what we were declared is, is that Ahithophel had this reputation that when Ahithophel spoke, he spoke as the oracles of God. But you know what's interesting in this whole thing is we're watching the life of Absalom. They have, they have the Ark of the Covenant. They have the priest. They have, uh, you know, all, all of the, the thulum and the, you know, everything's in Jerusalem. And not one time in this whole story, not one time do we find them asking God for counsel. Not one time is Absalom or Ahithophel, any of them, going and seeking the heart of God or the wisdom of God. Because when you're walking in rebellion against God, there's no way you would want God's wisdom in the middle of that. Because you want to do what you want to do, not what God declares. And, I've, and it blows my mind that, you know, they had access to, to everything that would bring about God's will or God's wisdom or God's intervention in this, and not one time do they go there. And I, I think for, for us, it, it should be that same one. You know, you, if you want your life to be in the will of God, then you have to be someone who's asking God and seeking God and, you know, going before him in prayer and because if you don't do that, what you're saying is, is that I, I, I got this and I really don't want God's input. I want to do this in my own wisdom, my own power, my own direction. And that's exactly where uh, Absalom is and it fell. They, they were going to accomplish their will by their means rather than God's will by God's means. And so we, we, we find that, that that's their their. Their direction, Ahithophel is going to be their voice piece. And Ahithophel was now living in bitterness. He wasn't seeking God's heart or God's counsel. And then look, look at chapter 17. Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, now let me choose 12,000 men and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he's weary and weak. I'll make him afraid and all the people who are with him will flee and I will strike only the king and then I'll bring back all the people to you. When all return except the man whom you seek, all the people will be at peace. And the saying pleased Absalom and all the elders of Israel. So Ahithophel had, had, a, had a strategy. 
David's weary. His men are weary. You know, they're, 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 they, they just, they've just been traveling all night. Let's swoop down on them. Let's strike while the iron's hot. Let's get in there, you know, have, have a very uh, clear, uh, uh, you know, plan to kill David. And then what will happen is that everyone will come back and everything will be fine. Now, th- this is what, what, what you know. You never will have peace in the middle of division. You can't. Right? When, when someone rises up to divide, you know, to bring peace in the middle of that after, you know, doing all of this, it, it, was, it was just wishful thinking. Now, what is also interesting in this passage is that Ahithophel's advice would have probably worked as far as taking David out. And when Hushai went back, it was God by the hand of David, directing him to go back. Watch what happens in verse 5. And Absalom said, now call Hushai, the archite here, and let us hear what he says too. And when Hushai came to Absalom, Absalom spoke to him saying, Ahithophel has spoken in this manner. Shall we do as he says? If not, speak up. So Hushai said to Absalom, the advice that Ahithophel has given you is not good at this time. For, said Hushai, you know your father and his men that they are mighty men. They are enraged in their mind like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field and your father is a man of war and will not camp with the people. Surely by now he's hidden in some pit or in some other place. And it will be when some of them are overthrown at first that whoever hears of it will say, there's a slaughter among the people who followed Absalom. And even he who is valiant, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will melt completely. For all of Israel knows that your father is a mighty man, and those who are with him are valiant men. Therefore, I advise that all of Israel be fully gathered to you from Dan to Beersheba, like the sand that is by the sea for a multitude, and you go to battle in person, and he'll come upon him in some place where he may be found, and we will fall on him as the dew falls on the ground, and on him and all the men who are with him, there shall not be left so much as one. Now, now, Hushai gives really the opposite counsel of Abishai. He says, look, you go now and you lose a couple of battles out there and everyone's going to turn on you and, you know, no one's going to, you know, follow after you because they're going to be afraid of David because David's a mighty warrior and all of his men are mighty warriors. He says, this is what we'll do. We'll gather all of the people together and then we'll all go and we'll just overwhelm them. Now, contrary counsel. And and what's interesting in, in this whole picture is is that God is the one who's going to confuse the enemy's camp. God is the one who's going to you know, bring Abishai's counsel to nothing, and he's going to bring Hushai's counsel to the front. Now, when Absalom is weighing this out. There's something that Hushai does. He says, look, you guys aren't strong enough to take David. What needs to happen, Absalom, is that you need to go into the battle yourself. And he was playing on his pride. You know, you're going to have the victory. You've got to be the guy in the battle. We, we, need, we need you out there. And he was setting him up. We're going to find out in a couple chapters, you know, that this is how Absalom dies. And God is working out all this stuff. Even though, you know, David David had all this, but you know know what conflict does? It reveals hearts. Conflict always reveals where a person's heart is. And what what God is doing, even though, you know, David brought all this stuff, God's going to weed out those who are bitter toward David. Everything's going to be exposed. It seems like whenever there is a conflict, you know, the hearts of people get exposed. You know, you find out really 
who's with you and who's not with you. You find out, you know, where, where, where the, the loyalties are and, and, and where the bitterness has been at. And, you know, you find out really what's going on in the depths. And it seems as though God is just bringing it all to the surface because look at the next verse, man. And, and this verse, when, when you read it, it, it kind of puts everything in perspective. So Absalom and the men of Israel said, the advice of Hushai, the archite, is better than the advice of Ahithophel. Watch this. For the Lord had purpose to defeat the good advice of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring disaster on Absalom. Guys, th- this was the Lord. It was the Lord guiding Hushai and what to say. It was the Lord that, that had brought him back from following David to go back into the city to go and, and kind of thwart all the plans of, of, of Ab- Ab- Abishai. And man can make all of his plans, but ultimately God's on the throne. I, I love Proverbs 19.21. Watch this, this, this proverb. There are many plans in a man's heart. Never the Lord, nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. Many plans in, the, in, in man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. And so we, we, we can plan and plot and do all of this. It, and, and, and yet in this whole time, and God is the one who's going to bring all this to pass. And I think as, as, as you look at this in, in, its, in, its, in its picture and in, in its thing, you know, David deserved everything he was getting. It, it was God's discipline to David. It was the consequence of his sin. Everything that's going down, all of it. It was a result of sin. And, and, and sin has a heavy price to pay. Yet in the middle of all of this, man, God was gonna accomplish his purpose. And, and think, think about in my life and your life, guys, you know what, sin... is something that destroys. It, it, it'll, it'll destroy you. It'll destroy your family. It could destroy your kids. I mean, you know, you allow sin in. And it'll have a price. David's living it out now. And, you know, ultimately, it's God's grace that, gets us through because if, if you got what you deserved if I got what I deserved it wouldn't be pretty right I, thank God he don't give us what we deserve I, I like what, what Paul says in the book of Romans chapter 5 he says when we were still without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly for scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Perhaps for a good man, someone even dared to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. I love that. You know, we're justified not by what we've done. We're justified by what Jesus did. And you're saved from God's wrath because of what Jesus accomplished, not because of what you... So if, it's not about what you deserved. It's about what God's offered you. He's he given you his grace. He's, a, he's forgiven you your sin. Now, there's oftentimes the consequence that still comes with it. And, and, and David's experienced that, but God's plan for us is for good. God, God wants the best. God desires your life to be happy. He wants your life to be whole. God, God, God is enough there plotting your demise. God, God, you know, God, God, God is wanting you. That's why he's given us his word, that's why he's given us his counsel, that's why he's given us wisdom, so that you, can, you and I can walk in truth, and as a result of it, we can experience his favor, his blessing. 
God loves you. I, I love Jeremiah 29 11. He says, the thoughts that I, that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and hope. Well, God was talking to Israel, but it's God's character. It's God's nature. You know, God is always wanting, you know, for us to be in a place where, you know, we're benefiting, not where we're being destroyed. And I think sometimes we forget that. I think sometimes we think, oh, God's just holding out on me. You know, if God would just let me do this, that would be, you know, my best interest. No, it's not. God's not holding out on you. God wants the best for you. That, that's why he's giving you truth. That's why he's giving you his word. So that you don't have to experience his discipline. You don't have to experience what, what David's, you know, going through here. And, and it, it amazes me because, you know, you, you look at this whole picture and you just realize, you know, God's plans for my life are for good. Now, we all go through trials and tribulations, but God wants nothing but the best. Not, not, he's not talking about the easiest. He's, he just has the best for you and mine. And, and watch this. Just look where this goes. Verse 15. How far do we get? 15. Thank you. And Hishai said to, the, to Zadok, and Abathar the priest. Thus and so Ahithophel advised Absalom, the elders of Israel, and thus and so I have advised. Now therefore send quickly and tell David, saying, do not spend the night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily cross over, lest the king and all the people who are with him be swallowed up. So Jonathan and Ahimeaz stayed in, in Rogel, for they did, dared not even coming into the city, so a female servant would come and tell them, and they would go and tell King David. And nevertheless, a lad saw them and told Absalom. But both of them went away quickly, and they came to a man's house in Burham, Burham who had a well in his court, and they went down into it. And the woman took and spread a, a covering over the well's mouth. They spread ground grain on it, and the thing was not known. And when Absalom's servant came to the woman in the house, and they said, Where are Hemias and jo Jonathan? So the woman said to them, They have gone over to the water brook. And when they had searched, they could not find them, and they returned to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, as they departed, that they came out of the well and went and told King David. And they said to David, Arise and cross over the water quickly, for thus has Ahithophel advised against you. And David and all the people who were with him arose. They crossed over the Jordan, and by morning light, not one of them was left who had not gone over the Jordan. And, and so, so, so remember Hushai had went, but also these two boys, Zadok and Abathar, the priest, had also wanted to go to D with David. And David said, no, go back and go serve Absalom. And then you guys be my advisors, you know, go and tell me what's going on. And here they are, you know, telling them what's going on. And they're hidden even as they were searching them out. And God protected them. You know, you see God's hand all the way through this and so that David gets word and then David's able to flee and all of these things come to pass because why God was working behind the scenes. And I think, I think sometimes we don't see that, you know, all, all the details of that. God is working out things. God, God, God is the one who's, you know, establishing the things that are right. He's, he's the one who, who, who's, you know, the situations, the circumstances in your life because God is the one who's on the throne. And, he, and he's doing all of this. Now, now here's, here's what's interesting. Watch this. And when Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled a donkey, arose, went home into his house, into his city. He put his household in order and he hanged himself and he died and he was buried in his father's tomb. Now, here, here's, what, here, here's what, what struck me as, as I was reading that. Ahithophel knew when 
they didn't heed his counsel and, and heeded Hishai's counsel that God was against them. He knew at that very moment, you know what? They're going to follow the other advice and he decides, you know what? I'm just going to go and end it all. And, and he, here's what's amazing, man, in this whole picture is that Ahithophel, because of his bitterness toward David, was willing to go even against the Lord, even against God's counsel and God's wisdom, and at this point, even to the point of taking his own life. And let me tell you something, man. Anyone who goes to that extreme, and you're going against God to the extreme. Isn't that a heavy picture? Where he just says, you know what? I, I, I'm not, I'm, I, I would rather never pay the consequences of my actions. David was willing to pay the consequence of his actions. He's still, he's still living it out. He hit the bell and says, I'm not going to pay the consequence for my actions. And I'm just going to end it all. Never, man, is that the will of God. Never is that a, a choice that, that would be the right choice to make, right? And it hit the bell because he had lost his mind. And that's what bitterness does to a person. That's what, you know, resentment does to a person or someone that's not willing to pay the price for their own sin. And, you know, you look at Hitler and you go, man, what, what a sad ending. He goes, you know what? I don't even want to deal with it. And he goes and he, and he goes and he hangs himself right here. Sad, sad. But that's where, you know, when you get to the point where you don't care what God says, you're not willing to forgive. You're not willing to, you know, let go. You're not willing, you know, because Ahithophel would, wouldn't listen to the Lord. Now he's at this place of desperation. And, and no, I mean, think about what's going on in our culture right now, guys. I, I, the rate of suicide is astronomical. It's crazy what's going on amongst our kids. And if we would just take God and, you know, and, and allow God to come in and, you know, transform us and work in our lives and surrender to his will and letting go. And, and what, what, what's incredible in this, in this whole thing is that the Hithophel now, you know, taken out of the picture. But watch, watch this. Look at verse 24. And David went to Mah Mahanim and Absalom crossed over the Jordan, he and all the men of Israel with them. And Absalom made... Amasa, captain of the army instead of Joab, and this Amasa was the son of a man whose name was Jethra, an Israelite, who had gone to Abigail, the daughter of, gone into Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister of Zerah, Joab's mother. So Israel and Absalom encamped in the land of Gilead, and it came to pass when David had come to Mahanam the Shubai, the son of Nahash, from Rabbah of the people of Ammon, Masher, the son of Emiel, from Lodabar and Berzalite, the Gileadite from Rogelum, brought beds, basins, earthen vessels, and wheat, and barley, and flour, and parched grain, and beans, and lentils, and perch seeds. I mean, I mean look, look at the grocery list. Incredible. Honey, and curds, and sheep, and cheese of the herd for David and the people who are with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. I love it, man. I, I, I love the whole picture because even in the middle of all of this, what do you find? God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness. David's being disciplined. David is, David is there, you know, wandering from his castle, from his, his beautiful home of cedar. And he's out in the middle of the desert, and here comes a guy, and he just shows up with beds. What? He's in the wilderness. Hey, Dave, we got a bed for you. It says California King. <laughs> yeah. And here, here's all the luxuries that you would have at home. You know, here's honey you know what I mean that grocery list was incredible because even in the middle of, of, of God's discipline in our lives man God will never take us to the point of, of, of you know not caring and not loving and not restoring and not helping because that's who God is and he'll discipline us because he loves us 
And, and he, he, he will al- allow correction in our life because he, he wants us to, to understand the consequence of sin. And God, God you know, he's not going to hold that back. Remember Hebrews chapter, was it Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, where he says, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. For whom the Lord love, he chastens. Like any father who loves his son, he's going he's to correct them. He's going to spank them. He's going to you know, put them back on the right track because God loves them. And God, our heavenly father, is going to do the very same thing for us. Not to the point of, of despair. Not to the point of, of, of you know, wanting to, to, to you know, throw in the towel. But, but, but he, you know, here's David in the middle of the wilderness. He goes, David, let me tell you how much I love you. Here's a bed. <laughs> Here's a basin. You know what a basin was? That, that's where you bathe. He brought him a hot tub. <laughs> Out in the middle of the desert. You know, you're just like, wait, 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 what, what, do you, what more evidence do you want that I care, that I love you, that I'm taking care of you, even in this instance? And, and I, I think it's, it's important for us to remember that. That, that God, God, God will allow us to go through some of the difficulties. And he'll even correct us. But but God will never do it to the point of despair. In the middle of it, you'll find your oasis, man, because you run to him. And David's gonna be seeking God's counsel. It's next chapter, next thing that that Absalom's finally defeated. And you know, it, it, it's, it, he, he dies. It, it, it just it blows my mind. Because remember what Absalom's pride was? His hair, remember that? The guy grew six pounds of hair every year. He had to cut it. It weighed so much. Can you imagine six pounds of hair? I mean, that's almost like lifting weights with your head. I don't know. I mean, you know, your hair. And and where do they find him? They find him going underneath a tree, hanging by a tree by his hair, stuck. His very pride that would bring him down. The very thing that, that he took his greatest pleasure in, right, is, is what caused his, his death. And yet, yet David, you know, humbled, broken. Let's close with this. Turn to Psalm chapter 3. Right? This, is, this is a psalm that was written during this battle with Absalom. Check this out. Psalm chapter three. A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. That, that's, the, that's the title in, in Psalm chapter three. Lord, how they have increased who troubled me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Selah. Remember all the guys mocking him? David, the Lord's against you. God hates you. You know, you're nothing but a rogue. You're a dog and they're throwing rocks and, 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 and David is going, look, they're mocking God that I've put my trust in you. And they say of me, there's no help from God. Look at verse three, I love it. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me. My glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and I slept. I awoke for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of 10,000 of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Isn't that great? You know what David understood? The blessings of the Lord were upon those who trust in him. He knew that. And, and, and this group that it, that it rebelled against, that it tried to overthrow, not once are they seeking the Lord's wisdom, the Lord's counsel, but David, even in, 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 in his own discipline right here, he's trusting the Lord. And guys, that's, that's where you find the comfort, man. That's where you find the strength. That's, that's where you find the sanity when you're going through the most difficult times in life is that I can run to the Lord and say, God, nothing can hurt me if you're with me. 
Nothing can, can break me if you're the one holding me. And, and as we, you know, look at David's life, and I, I think there, it's a great encouragement, a great encouragement to those who trust in the Lord.